one ugly motherfucker. You're one ugly motherfucker. You're one ugly motherfucker. Iconic movie monsters have been part of cinematic history from its earliest beginnings. In many cases, they've proven to be far more compelling and memorable than their human co-stars. Perhaps one of the best examples in contemporary culture is the Yautja, a species of high-tech alien hunters that spawned an entire multimedia universe and has maintained a fervent cult fan base for over 30 years, despite most of its actual films being lackluster and largely unconnected to one another. It first appeared in 1987's Predator, which struck the perfect balance between slow burn tension and shamelessly over-the-top thrills to produce a classic crossover of the sci-fi, horror, and action genres. Predator's sequels, however, would mostly disappoint fans and be quickly forgotten by casual audiences, except of course when they were so bad as to warrant public outrage. So why have the Predator movies never managed to reach the cultural status and influence of the original? And what does the dystopian near future look like for the franchise? It's the hottest summer on record. Pollution is choking the city. As bad as things are, they're about to get worse. Much worse. This interstellar saga had its genesis in Southern California, where former lifeguard Jim Thomas asked his former lifeguard brother John to help him develop an idea he'd had for a screenplay. This proposed script would center on a spacefaring alien hunter who travels to Earth seeking the most dangerous game of all. Which had to be man, and the most dangerous man was a combat soldier. With their screenplay completed and titled Hunter, the Thomas brothers set to work getting it into the hands of Hollywood with absolutely no connections or representation in the industry. Predictably, this resulted in hundreds of rejections as they tried and failed to find any interest for over two years. Luckily, a corporate shakeup at 20th Century Fox resulted in a young junior executive named Michael Levy moving into a new office and finding it completely empty, except for the Hunter script that was left lying on the desk. Levy read it out of curiosity and immediately recognized its potential. The new studio leadership agreed and recruited producer Joel Silver, fresh off 1985's Commando, which, of course, featured rising box office star Bill Duke as a big ass-kicking Green Beret. This Green Beret is gonna kick your big ass. And also Arnold Schwarzenegger. Silver brought the script to the Conan and Terminator actor, who took an immediate liking to the team dynamic of the Spec Ops squad. Regardless of this positive reception, the screenplay would go through countless uncredited revisions as the producers solicited drafts from a number of writers. Joel had asked me, do you want to do a draft of Predator? The studio's scrambling and they'd like to kind of uh, uh, get a different, different version. I didn't want to, but he said, well, you just come down to Mexico with us anyway. We'll put you in the movie. We'll hire him as an actor. And when he's there, stuck in Mexico, we'll give him the script and we'll make him rewrite it. And these constant changes only intensified when a pre-diehard John McTiernan was hired as director and began developing his vision for the film. The Thomas brothers would eventually bow out of the process entirely, and probably for the best, because their script wasn't done being ripped apart for the potential trophy inside. They told these two jokes that made Joe Silver laugh. And one day he just... I, I, they tell those jokes. I said to her, Jace, you got a big pussy. Jace, you got a big pussy. She said, why did you say that twice? And I said, I didn't. Well, I think the Thomas brothers who wrote the script, I really think they hate those jokes. I don't think they like them at all. The rest of the cast will be filled out with the biggest, burliest, manly man's men in the business, including Carl Weathers, primarily known for playing Apollo Creed in the Rocky films. I've got another movie, In the Jungle. You look like you belong there. How about being in this movie? I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you famous. I discovered you. Just like every other producer I've met right over the past 15 years, they discovered me. I said, sure, 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 I'll do this movie for you, right? So that's how I'm here. And professional wrestler Jesse The Body Ventura primarily known for the body. No one's gonna have to teach me how to patrol through a jungle. Nobody's gonna have to teach me how to take a sentry out. And nobody's gonna have to teach me how to fire the most awesome weapon handheld the world has ever seen. The production arrived on location in the jungles around Chiapas, Mexico, and the cast was subjected to an intense week of mock military training before cameras rolled. But this grueling regimen didn't stop once shooting started. Arnold and his fellow action mans would turn their rigorous workouts before and after filming into a competition, often descending into the kind of petty dick measuring that's inevitable when you cram this much USDA prime 80s beef into one movie. 5.30 in the morning, Arnold's knocking on my door going, get up, get up, we're going down to work out. Get up at 4 in the morning because you want that pump, but you don't want the other guys to see you getting that pump. We should measure our arms, who has bigger arms. Arnold's going, more reps, more, more, more. And I happen to view 
Arnold's wardrobe tape, and when my arms taped out one inch bigger than Mr. Olympia's, that made Jesse Ventura feel pretty good. Well, I'm very happy about that, because then my joke worked because I told the wardrobe department they should tell him that. There was, of course, another soon-to-be famous action star of the decade that was meant to be part of the cast. Bringing the titular hunter to life would be a young Jean-Claude Van Damme, struggling to perform his signature flip tricks and kung fu kicks in the creature's original costume, which was both impractical to move in and impossible to be scared of. Van Damme would protest about these conditions regularly and very loudly. You can see his eyes through the rubber muscles of the neck, and he's like, I hate this head. I hate it. I hate, hate, hate it. And these complaints were probably what led to his eventual firing, because by all accounts, the production was equally arduous for everyone involved. Gripping equipment and lighting and all the rest of it had, had to be hauled up and down hills endlessly. You can't stand anywhere that's flat. It's always on an angle on a hillside. So even between the shots, you still have to, you know, it's still tension. It's always tension. The decision to shoot the entirety of the film in an actual jungle led to constant issues, including almost every member of the production being mercilessly stalked by a different invisible foe. Traveler's diarrhea. Get, get your weapons ready, men. And then cut, and they run to the bathroom and just shit their guts out. These problems were further exacerbated by the constant headaches of the visual effects process, which required a hilarious red suit to achieve the cloaking effect, and precise on-set measurements that slowed production to a crawl. While shooting in a real location certainly added to the film's atmosphere and performances, surely some of these shots could have been done just as well on a set, sparing the crew, and the local plant life, a lot of damage. With the budget beginning to run low and the current design of the central creature failing to live up to expectations, it was decided to halt production. McTiernan put out a call for a redesigned alien and commissioned some concept art. Ultimately, the director turned to effects legend Stan Winston to complete the alien's design, who took these iterations back to his studio, along with a bit of inspiration from avowed mandible man James Cameron. Jim Cameron looked over to me and says, you know, I always wanted to see something with mandibles. And I went, oh, really? Well, so what? This new improved monster and the talented performer hired to play it Arnold, I'm looking for you, babe. would act as the final pieces to the puzzle. And once filming resumed in May of 1986, the predator we know and love would truly begin to take shape. The film begins with an alien vessel arriving in near-Earth orbit and launching a small shuttle to its surface before speeding away. Once we're planet side, we're introduced to Major Alan Dutch Schaefer smoking his stogie like a true ballsy stud. Where's my stogie? Certainly a lot of cigar smoking was put in the script because you could never find Arnold without a cigar in his hand anyway. Because I'm a stud. I'm ballsy. I don't take no shit from anyone. I smoke my stogie anywhere I want. I don't have to find a hideout place like you. <laughs> Dutch, a decorated Vietnam veteran, is being recruited to help rescue a group of hostages from guerrillas in an unnamed Central American country. Dutch is somewhat hesitant, but he's convinced to take the mission by his old army buddy, Al Dillon, now a high-level CIA operative. You son of a bitch. His spec ops team is dropped into enemy territory, where they quickly come across three bodies, skinned and hung from the trees in grotesque fashion. When the squad's tracker leads them to the guerrilla encampment, they witness one of the hostages being executed, which is apparently enough reason to endanger the lives of any other hostages still in the compound. Once the dust clears, Dutch miraculously finds a gorilla who survived their assault, named Anna, before realizing that the hostages are already dead, and that they had been CIA agents all along. You of course, all this espionage and intrigue is out the window once the squad realizes they're being stalked through the jungle by something far more terrifying than a band of rebels. <laughs> They're only able to catch quick glimpses of their nearly invisible attacker as it picks them off in the time-honored slasher tradition. <laughs> Dutch eventually decides to draw the creature away so that the giant weaponless Anna can make a break for the chopper. Get to the chopper! The hunter pursues him over a waterfall, shorting out its cloaking device and revealing the technologically advanced yet primal extraterrestrial beneath. 
The final act is a tense game of cat and mouse as a mud-covered Dutch plants a series of traps to lure the predator to its demise. His first few attempts fail, but out of sheer respect, the creature abandons its armor and weaponry to take on the Schwartz in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Dutch loses this battle immediately, but he's able to trigger one last trap, critically wounding his foe. Rather than admit defeat, the Yautja sets off a time bomb in his wrist gauntlet, mostly for the laughs. <laughs> Dutch narrowly escapes the explosion and is picked up the next day by Anna and the helicopter crew, followed by some completely inappropriate sitcom credits. Released in June of 1987, Predator topped the box office during its opening weekend. Most critics were lukewarm when not outright critical, but audiences ate it up and the Yautja itself quickly developed a fan base of its own. With no sequel immediately on the horizon, those fans would turn to the world of comic books to see more of their favorite ugly motherfucker. Dark Horse Comics had a license from 20th Century Fox, which allowed them to start a Predator series soon after they had shown success with an Alien series. And this new line of comics would go on to heavily impact the future of both properties. After a few dormant years, the temperature was rising again on a sequel to Predator. The project was finally given the green light, and producer Michael Levy brought the Thomas Brothers back in to ask them where they would take the burgeoning series. Jimmy and Johnny had clearly thought about this before, because they gave Levy five or six different sequel ideas to choose from. The one that most interested the studio was simple but compelling. Move the Predator's hunt to the real jungle, man. The concrete jungle. This creature realizes that this is a place to party. <laughs> The studio machine went into motion so quickly that the script hadn't even been finished when Joel Silver hired Stephen Hopkins, director of Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. Hopkins collaborated with the Thomas Brothers on script revisions and storyboards, and they completed the screenplay within three weeks. But that script would need to change when Schwarzenegger dropped out of the project, ruining their planned buddy cop scenario where Dutch would team up with a New York City police detective to take on another predator. The setting was also changed to Los Angeles, and the producers took this literally, choosing to shoot in the middle of downtown LA. Like the dense jungles of Mexico, filming in a real-life dystopia introduced countless problems. You tell residents, but in the end, no one really wants you there all night making a noise. You know, you get things thrown at you, bottles of piss or uh, bags full of human shit. You know, we'd find dead bodies under the garbage. And nowadays, I don't think we'd be able to do a lot of things we did then, which we'd be shooting in the streets with explosions. Um, we'd have, you know, helicopters landing in the street, you know, which is absolutely unheard of now. The post-production was strenuous in its own way, stretching to the last minute and barely making its release date. Predator 2 takes place in the future hellscape of 1997, where Los Angeles is in the midst of a climate-induced heat-slash-crime wave, with gangs battling it out in the street for drug territory and control of the hair care product market. One particularly intense shootout between the Colombian and Jamaican cartels attracts both a new Yautja hunter and Danny Glover as Lieutenant Mike Harrigan, who might be the most dangerous one of all. Harrigan's team attempts to infiltrate a building where the Colombians have retreated, but our new predator is one step ahead. Harrigan chases the lone and most luxurious survivor to the rooftop, but again the alien hunter steals the kill, and doesn't even disturb the picnic table below, nice. A chips to die for. <laughs> Back at the station, we're treated to the standard loose cannon cop speech, complete with power pointing for emphasis. But judging by his record, Harrigan really does need to be investigated. Immediately. Which means you're cutting off my dick and shoving it up my ass. We're then introduced to federal special agent Peter Keyes, played by confused time traveler Gary Busey. It's actually from the theory of relativity and from the theory of quantum mechanics. Take those properties and equalize them, and you have the quantum theory of gravity which is a discussion of how this universe started and how it will end. Later that night, Captain Willie's voodoo pirate posse take revenge on the Colombian cartel leader, but are suddenly ambushed by the Yautja, possibly because they were infringing on his copyrighted field dressing murder method. Harrigan and his officers find the grisly scene, but no real answers. 
and after one of his partners is murdered in a similar way, Harrigan vows to take revenge on this ruthless killer. But he quickly learns that it's much more than he bargained for. A fucking alien. The two engage in battle across the city, which leads onto the rooftops and then off them again, where the Yaucha hangs on helplessly as though it wasn't just effortlessly scaling a skyscraper earlier. Eventually, Harrigan follows the creature under the streets of LA and right to its massive spacecraft. On board, he and his alien foe face off in one final duel, where Harrigan is finally able to get the upper hand. The rest of the Yaucha tribe then decloak and rather than avenging their fallen brother, merely carry his body away and give Harrigan an antique flintlock pistol dated 1715 as a sign of respect to a man who's clearly a connoisseur of gun feel. The ship departs leaving Harrigan victorious but looking extra dusty. Predator 2 was released in November of 1990 to overwhelmingly negative reviews and uninspiring box office returns, debuting behind Three Men and a Little Lady. You're just a little lady and you need your sleep. Don't want to hear no job talking about something to eat. And remains the lowest grossing film in the series to this day. Most viewers at the time seemed to agree that the sequel shared all the weak points of the first film with none of its strengths. While the original Predator is not what you would call subtle, its bombast is tempered by McTiernan's slower pace and emphasis on building tension and atmosphere. Predator 2, on the other hand, is turned up to 11 at all times. Every actor is hamming it up beyond all good taste, and the characters they play are either generic archetypes or outright stereotypes. Fucking voodoo magic man. Despite all this, it's never dull, and throughout the runtime manages to make you feel like you just took a toot of some uncut Colombian raw. Not to say that it's a good movie. But at the very least, it definitely qualifies as a good, bad movie. Motherfucker. Over the years, Predator 2 would gain the appreciation of many fans, who defended it as a cornerstone of the series' mythology that introduced many intriguing clues into Yaucha culture and society. However, some did notice that many of these details were suspiciously familiar. They pointed out numerous similarities to Dark Horse's Predator comic series, which began in 1989. And we know the makers of Predator 2 were aware of the comics, since they included an overt reference to the Aliens vs. Predator series that had also begun the same year. Kind of a nod to that comic that was going on at the time. Joel Silver and the Thomases reportedly even reached out to the writer of those comics for some brief meetings, but neglected to ever give him any credit. There are also a few striking resemblances between Predator 2 and Aliens, James Cameron's sequel to the classic space horror film Alien. Are your boss okay? Hello. Fine. Yeah. How are yours? <laughs> have you ever been mistaken for a man? No. Have you? Not only do you have Bill Paxton at his most Bill Paxton. Wolf! I mean B.O. and barbecue! But the entire sequence of Busey's forces trying to capture the Predator is blatantly ripping off one of Alien's most memorable scenes. The reception of Predator 2 threw cold water on the Interstellar Hot Boys franchise plans for over a decade, on screen anyway. The Yaucha would continue their trophy hunting in a variety of different media, including comics, novels, and video games. The franchise mythology would continue to develop independent of the film series and, in many cases, continue to get more and more ridiculous. The Aliens vs. Predator comics became especially popular, inspiring numerous video games and even a couple of embarrassing movies of their own. But the lack of solo Predator releases wasn't for lack of trying. Throughout the 90s, Fox was blindly consulting any and everyone in Hollywood for potential Predator 3 concepts. In 1995, for example, they approached Robert Rodriguez to develop a script while he was working on Desperado. His version was quite ambitious and featured the return of Dutch Schaefer, who would venture to an alien planet filled with bizarre creatures, described by Rodriguez as more Avatar than Predator. His script was turned down for budgetary concerns and promptly filed away in the already overflowing rejected sequel vault at Fox for the next 15 years. After the disappointing returns of 2007's Aliens vs. Predator Requiem, Fox officially put its resources into resurrecting the mainline franchise, almost 20 years after Predator 2. In early 2009, the studio contacted Rodriguez to revive his long-lost project, but only as a starting point since budget was still very much a concern. Two first-time screenwriters, Alex Litvak and Michael Finch, were pulled from out of the 20th Century Fox salt mines and set to the task of reworking Rodriguez's script to a more practical scale. Rodriguez would decline the director's chair, opting to serve as producer and hiring Nimrod Antal to helm the project. 
Both were vocal about their intention to take their cues from the original Predator and basically ignore its largely unloved sequel. You can forget all the other Predators existed. If you only saw the first one and then you saw this one, you'd have a complete through line of the story that made total complete sense and that uh, it feels like uh, really this would be the sequel to Predator. They wanted to return to the character focus of the first film and to that end, sought to cast some high tier acting talent to bring more gravitas to the performances. It would also represent another attempt at some Yaucho world building, but this time entirely separate from the Dark Horse comics and their spin off properties. Shooting was completed in early 2010, and in July, The Predator made its triumphant return to theaters. Well, kinda. Predators begins in freefall, where mercenary Royce, played by Oscar winner Adrian Brody, plummets toward a tropical jungle canopy. After regaining consciousness, Royce finds himself well supplied with weapons and ammunition, and is soon surrounded by a motley crew of other heavily armed skydivers. We're introduced to each member of our ragtag group, each with their own sketchy backstories including assassins and convicted criminals. An uneasy truce is formed between them as they try to find out where they are, how they got there, and how they can escape. But it's not long before they discover the true extent of their predicament. We're gonna need a new plan. After an encounter with a pack of alien dogs... Help me! I'm getting attacked by a goddamn alien dog! He gave it his all. He beat the shit out of the puppet. Royce surmises that they're in some kind of game preserve, and that they were brought here to be hunted. Following the dog's tracks, the group come upon a hunting camp, or a Gorgoroth stage show, where they find a captive Yaucha that gives away their position and sets three more predators on their trail. As they flee, they encounter outside intel heartthrob Lawrence Fishburne. Lawrence Fishburne is one of those actors that everybody wants to work with. Playing Ronald Noland, a character who in some ways is very similar to Morpheus, and in other ways is a bit... off. Smelled you since you got here. They follow Roland Nolan to his hideout where he reveals that he's a former U.S. soldier who was brought to the planet years ago. He's managed to survive all this time, but has also totally lost his mind in the process. Ooh la la. That night, he tries to kill everyone in the group and scavenge their equipment for himself. In a last ditch effort, Roy sets off an explosion to alert the Yaucha of their location. As they're hunted down, the surviving group members try to outdo each other with heroic last stands so that the rest can escape. Following a little too closely in the footsteps of the first film, the climax of Predators involves our hero covering himself with mud and setting an elaborate series of traps to outwit and defeat the severely overpowered Yaucha Hunter. But this time, something about it feels drawn out and predictable. Finally, Isabel manages to hit the Predator with a sniper round, allowing Royce to deal the killing blow. The next day, the last two survivors witness another PUBG drop over the jungle and remain determined to find a way home. And that's where we leave off. Apparently there were no concrete plans for a direct follow-up, but it's hard to read an ending like that as anything other than sequel bait. Rodriguez, Antal, and the cast all expressed interest in coming back to tell the rest of the story, but any sequel plans would be contingent on Predators making a big splash. Yeah, it's exciting. The idea of reprising a character like this would be really interesting. You know, I think the film has to... We'll see. Upon release, Predators actually outperformed the first film at the box office and still remains the highest grossing in the entire series. Most reviews were positive, or at least mixed, and many fans felt it did a commendable job returning to the suspense of the original, even if it wasn't nearly as memorable. Today the movie holds up as one of the best in the franchise, though it runs out of steam around the midpoint and never really recovers. It also feels compelled to clumsily spell out its theme of hunters being hunted as though it were a revolutionary idea, not already kind of implicit in the first movie. It's because we are predators, just like them. We're the monsters of our own world. Message! But with the biggest box office receipts in the series, why did Predators never get a direct sequel? The answer isn't really clear, but whatever the reason, Fox would put the kibosh on any sequel speculation in 2014, when longtime producer John Davis announced that the next installment would be completely unrelated to Predators and its creative team. Davis would finally be getting that Shane Black script he'd gone to such lengths to obtain back in 87. Once we got him in Mexico, we'd get him to do a little bit of work. He said, no, you hired me as an actor. That's what I'm going to do. When that kind of became clear to all of us, we said, all right, he's the first killed. Be careful what you wish for. I can tell you it's a fucking great script. Shane is a fucking great director. Again, it's an R-rated movie, so I can say these things.
Once Shane Black officially signed on as co-writer and director of the new project, he came out publicly to quell any backlash, saying his film would be a sequel rather than a reboot. Clearly Black was doing damage control to assuage the concerns of the last film's fan base, but it's clear that by abandoning the cliffhanger of Predators, the studio was hoping for something very different. Namely, a tender, supple, soft reboot, as was all the rage in the late 2010s. This intention was more or less confirmed when the title was announced as THE Predator. Black and his co-writer Fred Decker spoke openly about their upcoming plans and how they wanted to eventize the series again. But whatever they had planned, it was much different than what was eventually shot, and even more different from what ended up in theaters. Shooting on their revised script was completed in Vancouver by June of 2017, shortly after a couple of on-set photos were leaked, showing what looked to be friendly Yautja in fatigues riding around in a tank with the human heroes. The mockery and memes that followed were only further bolstered when the script leaked as well, which featured a horde of JP4-esque genetic hybrid monstrosities in its finale. Scathing reviews from early test screenings were the final straw that drove Fox to mandate a massive set of rewrites and reshoots, including literally the entire third act. To our chagrin, and I'll take it's on me, when I saw the footage during the day, the, the climax of the movie, uh, it's, he, it. The final version of The Predator begins with some intense Yautja on Yautja action, which causes one of the ships to crash to Earth. The pilot launches its escape pod and lands right in the middle of a covert U.S. operation in Mexico. It attacks the Ranger Squadron, and only Quinn McKenna manages to escape with his life, and some sick Predator gear. The creature is then captured by a top-secret government task force led by Agent Will Traeger. <laughs> Trying to evade detection by the higher authorities, McKenna approaches some random man tending a bar and pays him to mail the Yautja armor back to the States for him. I mean, I guess that is a plan. And it proves successful, as he's apprehended immediately while the armor is shipped safely back to his house. The captured Predator is moved to a military base for study, while McKenna is taken to an interrogation room in the same facility. After he refuses to cooperate, McKenna is shipped off with a band of other military prisoners, and as soon as he steps on the bus, it's obvious what kind of movie we're in for. These are the loonies. It's a very attractive word. It comes off the tongue with a sense of energy and fun. The loonies. Our wacky gang of misfits who all have their signature one-dimensional character quirk, and that's their thing. Because fuck, God, God. In the lab, Agent Traeger discusses the captured specimen with scientist Peter Keyes, son of Gary Busey slash Gary Busey's character from Predator 2. Is your father proud of you? <laughs> very embarrassed. And a new recruit evolutionary biologist Casey Brackett. I heard you basically wrote the book on evolutionary biology. Wrote the book on evolutionary biology? You mean on the origin of species? But her expertise on hybrid strains wasn't the only reason she was enlisted for this ultra top secret project. She also wrote a letter to the president when she was six, asking to be told if the government ever found a space animal. I was put on a short list for a paper I wrote on hybrid strains. Computer cross-reference the letter, and here I am. Sounds like my man Shane Black was off some hybrid strains when he wrote this. During their examination, Brackett realizes that the captured Yautja has been hybridized with human DNA, and we learn that this has been the master predator plan all along, to gather genetic material from the most dangerous species across the Milky Way and combine it with their own to form new, more powerful mutations. I guess all those bone trophies were just for the aesthetic. Makes a nice little accommodation to this wonderful steam room. You know, you're invited over, uh, if you get a chance, I mean, you're gonna have a ball. The pursuing Yautja ship from the opening then arrives at the base. Weird ass bogey, sir. Allowing the human hybrid to break free and escape the lab. Seeing the commotion, McKenna and company hijack the bus and eventually join forces with Brackett. McKenna knows that the Yautja will go looking for its missing armor, so he and the loonies head to his home where his estranged wife lives with their son. He might be a lousy husband, but he is a good soldier. The team tracks down Quinn's son shortly before the escaped hybrid does, followed promptly by the much larger predator, who finally succeeds in killing its prey. McKenna and Brackett are then apprehended by Traeger and told of his theory that the Yautja are in a feeding frenzy to get all the genetic material they can before humans are destroyed by climate change. You remember a few years back when Hostess went bust? There was a run on Twinkies, snapped up from coast to coast. Get them while they still last. Remember? 
Ah, I see. So our DNA is like the cream filling. You want to know if someone fucked an alien? We later learn that their ultimate goal is to steal our autism in the belief that it's actually the next stage of human evolution, like some kind of fucking X-Man mutant gene. Much has been said about this plot point, and debate has raged as to whether it was outright offensive or just ridiculously idiotic. Let's say both and call it settled. The group is able to finally take down the Mega Yautja, and then, even though all you want is for this movie to be over, we get an epilogue that could baffle even the most cynical of moviegoers. McKenna goes to visit his son, whose superpowered autism has gotten him hired by the government to decipher Yautja tech. During the visit, a message comes through from the human hybrid's escape pod. Dad, the pod sent me a message. Rory, what's in that pod? And suddenly a high-tech set of fucking Transformer armor is released, dubbed the Predator Killer, teasing perhaps the least anticipated sequel of all time. Released in September of 2018, the Predator was anything but the resounding success the studio was banking on. We're back in time, babe. We're back in time. And we're gonna have a night that blends everything you've, well, you weren't alive, to hell with, fuck it. Um, you'll remember, we'll, we'll clue you. You're gonna love this. Well, what, what am I saying? We, it, you might like it, I hope you like it. Fans hated it almost as much as the critics did, most attributing the failure to a sloppy, unfocused story and terrible, cringy humor. <coughs> eat your pussy. Wait, what? <coughs> How you doing? You know, you just said eat your pussy. Hey, no, 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 you no. said eat my pussy. What the fuck is wrong with I him? Said, I said you're pushy. He said you're story. pushy. No, you no, said eat no. your pussy. I said sheesh, you're pushy. No, you I said eat pushy. my pussy. No, that's what he After its release, even more details about its chaotic production would emerge. Multiple characters and storylines were cut during the editing process, causing a few scenes to start or end out of nowhere. This installment also holds the distinction of being the only Predator movie to feature a real-life Predator, though he would also be cut from the final edit thanks to Olivia Munn's efforts. You know, there are people who get very mad at you for not just, you know, helping them bury it. It seems Shane Black had been hired to essentially marvelize the series after having such success on Iron Man 3, with the Predator killer armor being perhaps the most obvious example, but certainly not the only one. In the final tally, the Predator made a decent amount of money, but barely enough to cover its swollen budget following all the costly reshoots and recuts. Combined with the scorn from, well, pretty much everyone, SHUT THE FUCK UP! These dismal results forced the studio to abandon this mutated hybrid strain and look elsewhere for the next phase of evolution for the franchise. During production of The Predator, 20th Century Fox was officially acquired by the sinister-blooded clan the Walt Disney Company. This gargantuan and legally questionable merger would begin at the end of 2017, but would not be completed until March of 2019. This could have meant a vastly different future for the franchise, and the Thomas brothers even sued at one point to try and reclaim their copyright. But unfortunately for them, the next Predator film had already begun its development. In 2017, 10 Cloverfield Lane director Dan Trachtenberg and writer Patrick Ason had approached John Davis with a prequel story pitch, which addressed the identity of Raphael Adelini and how his pistol came into the Yauja's possession, though this had already been explored years before in the comics. Perhaps foreseeing how terrible The Predator would turn out, the newly renamed 20th Century Studios greenlit the film to start pre-production immediately. But thanks to the Rona pandemic, shooting wouldn't begin until 2021. The following summer, Prey would become the first Predator film to not be released in theaters, and also the first one since the original to exceed expectations. The film takes place on the northern Great Plains, where a Comanche woman named Naru, gifted and trained in healing, has been honing her hunting skills in an effort to be taken seriously by her village. While out stalking deer, she witnesses an alien ship tearing through the clouds and takes this as an omen, a thunderbird that signals she's ready to complete her people's rite of passage for hunters and warriors. On her quest, Naru is attacked by a grizzly and is narrowly saved by the cloaked Yautja she's been seeking. She manages to escape down the river, but the predator isn't far behind. In her panic, she runs right into a trap set by a band of French fur trappers. Their interpreter, Raphael Adolini, reveals that they also have her brother Tabe captive, and the two of them are used as bait to lure out the Yautja so the trappers can kill it. Obviously, it kills all of them, and after escaping, Naru gives medical treatment to Adolini in exchange for some firearm safety lessons. 
The Yaucha arrive at the trapper's camp, where Naru and Tabe take it on together, managing to wound it severely. But the creature activates its camo and turns the tables. Naru at one point has a clear headshot, and is about as well armed as you can be in 1719, but just runs away instead. Ashamed and determined to avenge her brother, she sets an overly long and elaborate trap to kill the predator and returns to the village with its head, finally respected and honored as the new war chief. But if Naru has Adelini's pistol, how did it end up on a predator ship? Well, the closing credits strongly imply that the full story doesn't have such a hopeful ending. Given that it was only released on streaming platforms, it's pretty much impossible to gauge Prey's financial performance. But the combined critical and fan reception has proven to be perhaps the best since the original. The film impresses on many levels, including its cinematography, practical effects, and attention to cultural and historical detail. Producer Jane Myers, part Comanche herself, worked closely with Trachtenberg to maintain this standard, even considering shooting the entire movie in the Comanche language. Though that was eventually rejected, you can still watch it dubbed in Comanche by the original actors, which is just fucking cool. We recorded guide tracks with our Comanche Nation language department. We recorded all the tracks because now all the actors get the choice rather than having voice actors, you know, uh, recreate the roles. So if you watch it in Hulu, on Hulu in Comanche, you're hearing Nadu, you're hearing Tabe, you're hearing all the actors recreate their roles. Unlike many of her human predecessors, Naru and her tribe are interesting in their own right and aren't depending on the Yaucha to appear and wake the audience up. Our heroine's tendency to run away when faced with danger does get a little frustrating as a viewer, but it's these kinds of flaws that help make her a more realized protagonist. She wants to be a great hunter, but she's not very good at it yet and has to grow as a character to achieve that goal. Not all of Prey's reviews were positive. Some longtime fans criticized it for being too slow and skimping on the Yaucha appearances, but the original Predator demonstrates why that's so important to making these monsters so effective. The vast majority of that first film is strictly spent with the human characters. The creature will pop out for a few seconds every now and then, and we briefly observe its thorough skull care regimen, but you don't really get a good look until almost an hour and 20 minutes in, and you don't actually see its true face until 20 minutes after that. The point being, the Yaucha and their obsession with hunting and killing things is not enough to hold up an entire movie on its own. They are most effective when used sparingly to increase the paranoia and struggles of the human characters. Prey can never be as iconic as the film that started it all, but it has come the closest of any of the sequels so far to understanding why the original Predator worked so well and how to recapture it. Examining the series as a whole, one begins to realize that the Predator movies aren't really a series in the truest sense. They're more an assortment of various false starts and do-overs. While its sister series Alien has had a somewhat inconsistent continuity over its lifespan, there's basically no agreed upon continuity in the Predator series at all following Predator 2. What the fuck is going on? And while pretty much every one of these movies attempted to bring back Arnold Schwarzenegger's Dutch at some point in its development, the series ended up having literally no recurring characters at all, human or otherwise. This scatterbrained approach mostly reflects the creatively bankrupt impulses of the producers and Fox leadership who've never seemed to know what to do with this series except that they want it to make more money, and they will keep rebooting and retconning until they stumble into that result. Even when an attempt was financially successful, like Predators, they were always busy hunting for a bigger trophy, a more impressive skull to hang on their wall. We tested the idea of Shane in this movie. We tested it on Facebook, we tested just a teaser poster, we got like 40 million hits just on a poster. Understandably, this lack of vision and direction has driven more and more Predator fans toward other Yautja-centric media over the years, to the point where the Predator movies have almost become a secondary element of their own franchise. Illustrating this perfectly is the fact that Schwarzenegger has never agreed to appear in any more Predator films, but did return to the role of Dutch for a Predator video game. My name is Dutch. And this is my story. These comics, novels, and other media have built out quite a wealth of lore about the Yaucha and their culture, while the films themselves have done very little. The species didn't even have a name until 1994, when the term Yaucha was coined by a novelization of a comic book and has still never been used on screen. Well, we took a vote. Predator's cool, right? Yeah. Fuck yeah. Many hardcore fans suggest that the movie should take a similar approach and focus on the Yaucha themselves rather than the same recycled mercenary types. And looking at a lot of these milquetoast human characters, you can see their point. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't have human characters at all. 
it just means they need to be better. Devoting an entire movie to the Yaucho would require explaining a lot more about them, which always runs the risk of destroying the intimidating nature of the creatures, as well as other issues. In fact, one of the few praises you can apply to almost all of the Predator movies is that they don't over-explain their monster and spoil all the mystery. <clears throat> And any time one of the movies has tried to delve into more detail about the Yaucha, it often boils down to Big Predator Hunt Small Predator. Actually, pretty much all of Yaucha society seems exclusively centered around hunting, which belies the real story function behind their creation. Much like the Xenomorphs, the Yaucha weren't originally designed to have a richly nuanced backstory. In fact, both of these famous movie monsters were only vaguely described in their respective scripts and wouldn't reach their final forms until well into production. That's because the only thing that mattered to the actual story was that they were scary to us and the human characters, hence why the Yauch's only cultural exports seemed to be blood and or skull related. In the comics, it might be cool or badass to learn all about their arsenals and blood feuds or whatever, but it's definitely not scary. And that's the whole point of the Predator in the Predator movies. For the first time in a sharp decline history, we're actually able to end a video on a positive note. Yeah! Hopefully Prey will be the final pressing of the reset button, and the series can continue forward instead of retracing its steps yet again. Rumors indicate that Prey 2 is already in active development, but it's hard to predict Disney's long-term plans now that they're in full control of all former 20th Century Fox properties. Given the Predator's established track record of insane crossovers, don't be surprised if you see Tales of the Yout Jedi coming soon to Disney+. Shit, they own 75% of the entertainment industry at this point, so it's probably more likely to be Aliens vs. Predator vs. Avatar vs. Avengers vs. Power Rangers vs. Pirates of the Caribbean vs. Muppets vs. Percy Jackson vs. Planet of the Apes vs. Beverly Hills Chihuahua.